Hello. In this video, we're going to look at a modified form of starred problem 3.2.25. For a continuous payment stream on a loan, find the outstanding balance as a function of time and show that it is decreasing and concave down. Kind of a general thing that's going to require some calculus, but we're going to illustrate some important points, so I think it's definitely worth your while to look at. <clears throat> Here's the problem statement. Modified to be simpler than what you find in the book. A loan of amount L is being amortized not with a discrete payment stream but with a level continuous payment stream over n interest periods interest rate i per period so you could pretend if you want that the periods are years and the payments are in say dollars per year or euros per year it's a level payment stream the amount of the payment is given by this constant right here amount of payment per period for example per year L, the loan amount, divided by this present value of a continuous payment stream with payment 1 per unit time. Two main things to do. One, find formula for the outstanding balance as a function of time. And two, use calculus, calculate these derivatives and show they are negative to illustrate that this curve, the graph of this function of time, is both decreasing and concave down which illustrates a general fact, whether you're, you are in the continuous or discrete case, that the graph you see goes down and has a concave down kind of shape over time, which means if you're paying enough interest to make the balance go down to zero, that your balance does go down over time, the graph is decreasing, and in fact goes down faster and faster over time, which means more and more of your payment goes toward principal as time goes on and less and less toward interest. All right, so that's a, that, that's a general fact that holds in this situation and also in the, the discrete situation. The graph would look like that, although in the discrete situation you don't really connect the dots. You just make a bunch of dots that look like this. Turns out also the intercepts are L and N. In other words, the initial balance is the loan amount and the balance does get paid off by time N if this is your amount of your payment per period. All right, so let's think about part A now, or part one, I should call it. You have this level payment stream for n periods. You could initially cut, call the amount k if you like, and you could think about a particular moment in time and say, I want to think about the outstanding balance as a function of time, maybe using the retrospective method, which means you're looking back in time, you go back to the original loan amount and you promote that back to time t by multiplying by 1 plus i to the t and you subtract off the accumulated value of all the payments to this point which would be the rate of payment times um, the future value s bar sub t with interest rate i. Okay, That would be the retrospective way of thinking about the outstanding balance at time t. It is one formula for OBT. It's not in an ideal form for differentiation yet. We can write it in other forms. For example, we can write 1 plus i to the t as e to the delta t, where delta is the force of interest. When i is constant, that would be the natural log of 1 plus i. Uh, we can go ahead and replace k with what it equals if we like. L over a bar sub n with interest rate i. Now let's initially leave the s as is. Do notice this is a constant. t is the variable here. This is a constant in front of that. I think I would also like to get these things in terms of delta further by using the fact that a bar, this thing here, if you think uh, if in your memory what that formula is, it's 1 minus v to the n over delta. I'm dividing by a bar, so I'm going to get a delta on top and a 1 minus v to the n on the, on the bottom, which I'm going to write as 1 minus e to the negative delta times n. For the future value, notice that's a time t. That's your variable here. You could think of this as 1 plus i to the t minus 1 over delta or e to the delta times t minus 1 over delta. These deltas cancel. And I think the last thing that I'd like to do here is I'd like to distribute this through this set of parentheses here after canceling the deltas and rearrange so that I have a term uh, 
the term and, and factor, so I have a term only involving e to the delta t and then a term that doesn't. And actually that term that involves e to the delta t will also involve an L. Uh, L e to the delta t is going to be factored out. And with this term I'm going to be left with a 1. And with the product of this thing and that, I'm going to be left with a minus 1 over 1 minus this, which I can write, I think I'll go back to v to the n now, like that. A little quicker to write. It's constant, so it doesn't matter. And then I have the term that does not involve L e to the delta t. It doesn't involve a t at all. It comes from this thing times minus 1, which will be plus L over 1 minus v to the n. Okay? This is uh, the final form for the formula for the outstanding balance as a function of time that I want to write. Before I go on, I am going to say that in the next video that I make, I'm going to come back to deriving this equation using another method, using differential equations. So if you like differential equations, that's something you have to look forward to. If you don't, well, you should watch it anyway. Uh, before I go ahead and calculate the derivatives of this thing, I do want to verify these intercepts. The outstanding balance at time zero I could do it with this formula, but let's go ahead and use this form of it. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. So I plug in t equals 0. This becomes e to the 0, which is 1. Let me go ahead and um, get a common denominator for these fractions. This is going to be the same as 1 minus v to the n over 1 minus v to the n. Then when I combine, the 1s are going to cancel. I'm going to get a negative v to the n over 1 minus v to the n times L times e to the 0, which is 1, plus L over 1 minus V to the N. Uh, those have a common denominator as well. And I can combine them and factor out the L out of the top. I'm left with a 1 from this one and a minus V to the N from this one. And we get cancellation of the 1 minus V to the Ns. This simplifies to L, just like I said. How about at time N? Do we get a value of 0? We will have a negative v to the n over 1 minus v to the n times L times uh, e to the delta times n, which will be 1 plus i to the n, which is going to cancel uh, with v to the n to give you a 1. And then I have this term here. So I end up with, these already have a common denominator, this times this is 1. I got a minus L and a plus L up top. This does simplify to 0, so that's good. All right, now let's calculate the derivatives. And I think I will leave this thing inside the parentheses as, um, as this thing up here. And I guess that would be the final form of the formula. I could think of that as the final form of the formula if I like. Let me go ahead and rewrite it down here. That's going to be convenient for us. All right, so differentiate this with respect to t. Its first derivative, that's a constant. It goes away, becomes 0. With this one, this is a constant. I get L e to the delta t. I get another factor of delta from the chain rule. So I get, ultimately, negative delta v to the n over 1 minus v to the n l e to the delta t for the first derivative. And this is certainly a negative quantity. v to the n is going to be between 0 and 1. So 1 minus v to the n is also between 0 and 1. All of three of these things are positive. And this thing is positive, but then I have the negative sign there. So this becomes a negative quantity. So the derivative is decreasing in the situation that is the typical situation, v to the n is between 0 and 1. And the second derivative only adds an extra factor of delta. Now, so I get negative delta squared, v to the n over 1 minus v to the n, l e to the delta t, so that's still negative. Okay, so we have verified that these derivatives are always negative, so the graph is now verified to be decreasing and concave down, and I also verified these conditions. So the graph really does look like that. 
And it does generally look like that in the discrete case, except you don't connect the dots. So that's an important point to realize about these situations.